great to have everybody with us. It is one of those services that is a bit somber. You know, it's a time of reflection, Remembrance Sunday here in the UK. Um, to remember, as Dave's already said, those, uh, the fallen, those that, you know, those names that only God knows who have sacrificed their lives, men and women, and, in, and the innocents as well, who have not even been involved in war. So many. And so here every year in Great Britain, um, we unite, to make sure that no one is forgotten, to remember and honor those who have sacrificed themselves to secure and protect our freedoms, as Dave has said. Now, in London, at the Cenotaph, that is where um, veterans would normally gather. It's there that, the, the, that that is the memorial to the fallen. The Cenotaph is actually a, an empty tomb built uh, in 1990 and unveiled in 1920. So that makes this year the 100th anniversary of the Cenotaph. So it's quite ironic, really, that a that hundred years on, there'll be only, I think it's 26 veterans at the uh, Senator. Um, and it was built back then to commemorate that 1.1 million soldiers of the British Empire who sacrificed their lives for king and country. And obviously that now extends to include all conflicts that this uh, land of ours has been involved in but again this covid has uh, caused restrictions and many have been um, dismayed about this and understandably so many veterans who uh, want to go and pay their respects to comrades have not been able to as one second world war uh, soldier lamented he said i was blown up in germany nearly died twice I'm not bothered about a virus, but unfortunately, there is great fear and panic over this. So it has been, as Dave said, um, it is a closed event. I just want to look back. We're going to read some poems together, some uh, war poems. Um, just look back just for a moment to, to that 1914 when, when the war kicked off in Europe. And that early part from August to September. There were three major battles there. There was the Battle of Mons, the Battle of Cato, and the Battle of M M Marne. And uh, huge losses on both sides, French, British, um, German, and others. And it was in that mid-September that across the channel on the Cornish cliffs, sat a man by the name of Lawrence Bignon. And uh, there was all these unimaginable things happening, the horrors of war in, in France. But there he was across the water, and he wrote a poem entitled For the Fallen. And so I'd like to ask Nadine, when she's ready and unmuted, to, to read that to us. Thank you. With proud thanksgiving, a mother for her children, England mourns for her dead across the sea. Flesh of her flesh they were, spirit of her spirit, fallen in the cause of the free. Solemn the drums thrill, death august and royal, sing sorrow up into immortal spheres. There is music in the midst of desolation and a glory that shines upon our tears. They went with songs to the battle. They were young, straight of limb, true of eye, steady and aglow. They were staunch to the end against odds uncounted. They fell with their faces to the foe. They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemned. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. They mingle not with their laughing comrades again. They sit no more at familiar tables of home. They have no lot in our labour of the daytime. They sleep beyond England's foam. But where our desires are, 
and our hopes profound, felt as a wellspring that is hidden from sight, to the innermost heart of their own land they are known, as the stars are known to the night, as the stars that shall be bright when we are dust, moving in marches upon the heavenly plain, as the stars that are starry in the time of our darkness, to the end, to the end, they remain. Okay, well, thank you, Nadine, for reading that poem, the poignant uh, verses and words and that famous phrase, at the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. And we have to remember them when we see what is going on in our world today. We as Christians believe that God is sovereign and we say amen to that. But at the same time, men and women have died for freedoms that seem so fragile now, seem so easily taken away. And um, we need to keep praying hard about um, the changes in society and the, the really the move away from, from Christian values, Christian morality and, and Christian thinking. But you know, the Bible is candid when it comes to war. It doesn't um, mince words. In Ecclesiastes 3 verse 8, um, it says that there is a time to love and there is a time to hate. There is a time for war and there is a time for peace. And that's just an observation of life. And that's a fact of life. But you know, war raises a question for us as Christians. Because if there is a time for war, as the Bible says, then should we as Christians participate? I don't want to spend too long on this, but I think it's a point that generally gets missed. And the simple answer is that really that's between you and God. You know, it, it really is at the end of the day between you and God. But there are points to bear in mind. For example, the word of God tells us, do not murder. In Exodus 20, 13, Deuteronomy 5, 17, um, and also in the New Testament, James 2, 11. But you know, murder is a deliberate act, or homicide in America. It's that, it's that, it's that deliberate act to take an innocent life. And when God ruled in ancient Israel, when he, that was a theocracy, when God ruled there, God put into law, given to Moses from the hand of God, that corporal punishment was part and parcel of their life. And that meant that the death penalty existed in ancient Israel and was employed there to remove wickedness. Moreover, we see as we read through um, the uh, Joshua and the conquest of the land, that there was war and uh, that war was to cleanse the land. Now, of course, Israel was a theocracy. We today are not theocracies. We are not God-ruled in that sense, although we will be one day. Instead, we now live under governments. And gov God has assigned governments over nations to care for its citizens. And so we have a police force. We have the military, all who are there to uphold the law and to defend us as citizens. So then... War is a, is a strange animal, you know, it, it, it's, got, it's a double-edged sword. It's not something we want to see, and yet it's there. And there are good wars and there are bad wars. But I want now just to move on to another reading. Um, and this is by a Christian who fought in the First World War, um, J.M. Rose Troop, and he composed this in 1916. And, and it's entitled, What is War? Jacob could read that, please. What is war? Ask the young men who fight, men who defend the right. Ask them, what is war? Honour or death, that is war, say the young men. What is war? Ask of the women who weep, mourning for those who sleep. 
Ask them, what is war? Sorrow and grief, that is war, say the women. What is war? By ways beyond our ken, God tries the souls of men, sends ret retribution just, punishing vice and lust, God's wrath for sin, that is war. Okay, I think it's a really um, powerful poem. You have war in the sight of young men. What is war? Honor, honor or death, that is war. For those that lose loved ones, the wives at home, sorrow and grief, that is war. And then the, the last verse here, he relates it back to God, that God sends retribution just, punishing vice and lust, God's wrath for sin, that is war. And I think that poem fits well into um, what Paul said to the Romans in Romans chapter 13, verse 4. I'll read that to you. Concerning kings and governments, this is what Paul said. He, for he, is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. And so what we see there is, is, is God has placed in power governments. And of course, there's some good, some bad, some indifferent, but they are there to bear the sword and to avenge those whom God who are wrongdoers uh, the avenger who carries out god's wrath on the wrongdoer which fits with the poem god's wrath for sin that is war but you might say well pastor yeah okay but didn't jesus tell peter put your sword back in its place for all who draw the sword will die by the sword well yes he did and didn't Jesus teach us to turn the other cheek, to love our enemies? Well, that's true as well. But let's evaluate what Jesus said in the context of history, in that first century when Jesus spoke to Peter. You know, in the first century, the belief was that the Messiah would come and he'd be a warrior Messiah and he would free Israel from the yoke of the Romans. There were zealots at the time, and they were all about violent revolution. But Jesus, he was the one who told Peter to bring the sword. It was Peter who used it, but then he said those words, um, put the sword back in its place. What he was really saying was that we're not going to bring in the kingdom by revolution. You know, that's not the answer. Instead, he led the disciples. He steered them clear of that sort of violent, uh, wanton rebellion. And he taught them that to be Christians in this world is to, to be a peacemaker, is to do our very utmost to live lives of peace. And he pointed to himself, really, as the cure for war, that where love where we love our enemies wherever possible so then that being the case does that mean that jesus was a pacifist or that god is a pacifist well clearly not as you read through the old testament god nor jesus are pacifists in moses song of deliverance moses declared in exodus 15 verse 3 he says yahweh is a warrior that is a man of war Yahweh is his name. As Isaiah speaks the same way, Isaiah 42 and verse 13. Yahweh will go forth like a warrior. He will stir up his zeal like a soldier. And he will shout, yes, he will roar and he will prevail against his enemies. And we know that God went before Israel. He was a God of war. He fought holy wars against the Canaanites. So we cannot limit God in that sense and, and, and come up with this I don't believe uh, this idea that Jesus teaches pacifism 
He teaches us to do our best to live at peace in society. But there is a time when we have to rise up. There is a time when a, when a line is crossed, where we have to defend ourselves. If somebody breaks into your home, you don't stand there and let him beat your wife. You don't let him rape your wife. You, you, you defend. You defend the innocent. You defend. This is about justice. This is about, as God would say repeatedly in the Old Testament, to defend widows and orphans. And so in Christian ethics, there is a um, theory known as the just war theory. And it really began with St. Augustine and carried on through the Reformation. And Augustine wrote this. He said that peacefulness, which is what we aim for, peacefulness in the face of a grave wrong that could only be stopped by violence would be a sin. Defense of oneself or others could be necessary, especially when authorized by a legitimate authority. Notice what he says there. Peacefulness in the face of grave wrong that could only be stopped by violence would be a sin. In other words, if you were to sit back and watch people be murdered, innocent people, then you would be committing a sin. That we are to defend those who are unable to defend themselves. Especially, Augustine said, if that's legitimized by um, an authority because we live in a world where there is a government and there are, are authorities a bit further on from uh, augustine medieval theolo theologian thomas aquinas he argued the same way he said that this was only uh, that it was only in the pursuit of justice that the good intention of a moral act could justify negative consequences including the killing of the innocent during a war. In other words, in the pursuit of justice, in the pursuit, in, in that good intention, sometimes the killing of the enemies of justice is necessary. And so that's the just war theory. And the two principles to that, based around Romans 13, 4, the first is legitimate authority. In other words, don't, try and raise up your own um, revolutionary sect, but rather uh, work with the government. So there's legitimate authority to act, and then there's also, you must have a legitimate reason to act. War should not be undertaken in response, sorry, war should be undertaken in response to serious wrongdoing. There must be, therefore, a just cause for war for which war is a proportionate response. Those fighting should also have the right intention. You don't go to war just to kill people or to steal or plunder. You go for the right reasons. Um, it's not about military conquest or economic gain, but it is about fighting for the rights and securities of the innocent to bring justice and peace for all. And so in this just war theory, the last resort is war, but it is at times a necessary evil in this world in which we live, which of course is a fallen world. On the other hand, there's been some terrible abuses of this theory. You could argue for and against multiple actions of war over the centuries as being wrong. I know of ones in the RAF who left the RAF because they would not fight in the uh, Iraq war. They felt it wasn't a war that was just and that it was based more on, on the need for oil and control. So, and again, that's where conscience comes in. If we go back in our history to the uh, American War of Independence, that was an armed rebellion initiated by the 13 American colonies in Congress against Great Britain. And why did they, they go to war with Great Britain? Well, the colonialists objected to Parliament's taxation policies and also lack of representation. And it's interesting as we go back and we look at that first great awakening, that Christian awakening in America, 
Uh, John Wesley was one here in the UK who urged restraint and, and urged dialogue and was more leaning towards um, pacifism. While across in the colonies, you had ones like John Witherspoon and Jonathan Mayhew who fanned the flames of revolution, calling it the will of God. And the colonialists saw themselves not so much as anti-government, because that would be wrong, but as anti-tyranny. In other words, there's a time when we have to stand up to tyranny. And the colonialists saw the king of England as violating scripture, being a wicked king, like many of the wicked kings in the Old Testament. They didn't consider him a servant of God or a man of God. And therefore, uh, the American War of Independence began. It did. They did try to um, have peaceful dialogue and and so forth, but it was met with armed uh, military resistance. In, in 1770, the British fired upon unarmed citizens in Boston, which became known as the Boston Massacre. And um, we know the rest. There was war, and the French were involved as well, as often they are. And uh, the colonialists declared independence on July the 4th, 1776, and Great Britain had to recognize their autonomy eventually in 1783. Um, and this is war for different reasons. Um, some scholars feel that that war was to begin with not, not, not really, couldn't be really authorized in scripture. But nevertheless, God has used the United States in a mighty way. But the country's had its own uh, struggles when it comes to war. 80 years after that, after nearly 80 years from 1776, 80 years later that they ended up in a civil war, 1861 to 1865. 600,000 Americans died in the American Civil War. And again, we see from the election results, a divided nation. Then the Europeans fare no better when it comes to war. During World War I, theologians in Germany and in Great Britain argued that the war was a just war. Both, both countries said this is a just war. They tried to prove that what they were doing was just. So I think we'd all agree that man, no matter what war it is, whether it's Vietnam or Korea, whether we go back to the Napoleonic Wars or go back to more ancient wars, there is no perfect war both sides suffer and we would all long to see a day when there is no war and so we ask the question how long O oh lord how long O oh lord and i'd like sue to read this poem by robert palmer from 1917 entitled how long O oh lord how long O oh lord how long before the flood of crimson welling carnage shall abate. From sodden plains in western east, the blood of kindly men streams up in mists of hate, polluting thy clean air. And nations great in reputation of the arts that bind the world with hopes of heaven sink to the state of brute barbarians whose ferocious mind gloats o'er the bloody havoc of their kind. Not knowing love or mercy, Lord, how long shall Satan in high places lead the blind? To battle for the passions of the strong, oh, touch thy children's hearts that thy may know. Hate their most hateful, pride their deadliest foe. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Another Christian soldier that was who wrote that. And did you notice that in there, he says, Lord, how long shall Satan in high places lead the blind? That's a good question. And it helps us to understand what's really behind war and conflict in our world. Satan, the devil, is that arch deceiver whose first deception was his own self deception and who over time has fallen into ever deeper deception self delusion 
a victim of his own lies and deceptions. And he seeks to devour those around him, to, to bring them in on his lies. He, he plants lies, he nurtures lies, and his aim is to bring those down with him into the pit of hell. And he's been mighty successful. And I believe that the scripture says that he is the God of this system. And behind much of what we see going on, he is there. Or at least his minions are there pulling strings and causing the tragedy in the human race that we see. And war is a tragedy. War is indiscriminate. You know, there was a time where, if you go, say, back to the Napoleonic Wars, where you'd have two armies that met in a field and it would be dealt with there and then in, in a, you know, a barbaric way, but also in a gentlemanly way. It was a strange setup that they had there. But now it touches everybody. I mean, uh, car bombs and innocent people being blown up and there is nobody safe. There's no... It's not, there's no, not a, not a um, sane war. Um, well, there never has been, but you know what I mean. It's a, a war of attrition. It, it, is, it is indiscriminate. War is something that touches every aspect of life. It affects the mind. It affects the heart. It, aspect, it affects the spirit. It affects how we see other people. It affects others around us. And so as we reflect on, on the horrific consequences of war, don't we as believers cry out with the Lord, sorry, with the saints, how long, O oh Lord? Don't we, don't we agree with that poem written in 1917? How long, O oh Lord, how long? And I think that that, is drawn most likely from Revelation 6, 9, where Jesus is the Lamb of God who breaks open the fifth seal. And in Revelation 6, 9, it says, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God, because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, Will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? How long, O oh Lord, before you put an end to war and you avenge the souls of the saints? And the answer, brethren, is soon. Amen. For 2,000 years, we've seen the birth pains of the last days speeding up and manifesting in ways we, we couldn't imagine on a global scale. Jesus said this would happen. You've read it many times. Jesus' great chapter on the end of the age in Matthew 24, verse 3 to 8. Jesus said there to his disciples, it says he was sitting on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus answered them and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. And you will be hearing of wars and of rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened for those, these things must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. In various places, there will be famines, there will be earthquakes. But all these things are the beginning, are merely the beginning of birth pains. In other words, Jesus said, yes, these things would continue, but there would be an acceleration. What do we see today on an unprecedented scale? We see the rise of pseudo Christ. Men and women who, who almost carry that persona of, of being godlike, pseudo-Christ. Some claim to be Christ. There is a, 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 
a love the love of many would grow cold jesus said there's a there's a there's a coldness um certainly towards god christian morals would be rejected everything goes but not what christians believe wars and national conflicts well they've gone on since jesus uttered those words but they've accelerated especially in the 20th century and uh, even today earthquakes natural disasters many would try to say oh well no actually it's just because we've got better recording devices the fact is that that things are increasing apostasy in the church was another sign the christians would abandon the faith there'll be those that claim to be christian who were not christian who who believe things contrary to the word of god famines and plagues well you know there's been plagues through the centuries but we're here supposedly in the midst of a pandemic that is affecting the whole world the whole economy of the world and then we have that glorious truth that so many christians miss and that is the restoration of israel the great promises to abraham isaac and jacob and his offspring another sign that we are in the last days that we're in this period of birth pains is is the rise of anti-semitism the hatred toward god's people and jesus likened the end time society to the days of noah in matthew 24 38 to 39 jesus looks back to the historic account of the flood and he says for in those days before the flood people were eating and they were drinking they were marrying and giving in marriage up to the day noah entered the ark and in this translation it says they were oblivious until the flood came and swept them all away so it will be at the coming of the son of man in other words we pray for revival we long to see god move we long to see you know pockets of of, of, of uh, people say you know we long for it we pray for it and yet the majority will be oblivious to the signs of the times the majority will not see it until the son of man comes paul also paints a chilling picture of this end time society in second timothy 3 1 to 5 he says it will be characterized by by three loves the love of self which we could call humanism putting man at the center the love of money which is involves materialism and the love of pleasure the love of having things doing things in that sense which we would call hedonism paul also points out that the payoff of a carnal lifestyle where there is no place for god there's no place for spiritual things that the, the, the payoff of this carnal lifestyle is nihilism nihilism is a society wallowing in despair a society that is empty that has no direction or purpose or meaning and that sadly is where we are but for us it is a sign of jesus return in romans 1 28 it says that men's minds will be depraved that people would call evil good and good evil and we see an acceleration of this not only that but common sense has gone out the window people just um cannot see what's going on but discerning christians we don't despair do we we don't give up our hearts do not grow faint rather we we raise our heads heavenward and set our hearts towards savior because when the savior comes wars will end amen of course there are always the scoffers there are always those who say well no i don't believe any of that well god's word tells us about such scoffers in to three verse three a few verses i'd like to read to you before we get back to our um main theme of of uh, remembrance second peter 3 3 
Know this first of all, in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts. Mockers are following after their own inclinations, those things that are mentioned, humanism, materialism, hedonism, nihilism. It drives them to deny. So they mock. And they say, where is this promise coming? For ever since our fathers fell asleep, all continues just as the same as from the beginning of creation. They see everything as just going on as normal. They cannot see what we are teaching, what we are preaching. Peter goes on, for when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are also being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promises as some count slowness but he's patient towards you not wishing for any to perish but for all to come to repentance why is there still wars why are there still disasters it's because jesus hasn't returned and in so doing he has extended his mercy to the world and so we await a new heavens and a new earth and this one that we live in and one that people fight over and don't get me wrong we should be good stewards of planet earth we should do our bit but one day this earth and this cosmos will be rolled up like a scroll because we as believers know that there is a new heavens and a new earth on the way one which won't be bloodstained like our planet you know we have a beautiful blue planet don't we you know, when you look at it from, from the heavens, from, the, from, the, from space, and yet when God looks at it, it is red, it is bloodstained. And so we have to, or God will start again. And so Peter continues in verse 10, The day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth with all its works will be burnt up. So since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy acts of conduct and godliness? And, and so the very fact that we are living at the end of the age, the very fact that this cosmos will be rolled up like a scroll, Peter asked the question, what ought we to be in holy acts of conduct and godliness? Only you can answer that. Only you know where you are in your work, walk with God. Only you know if you're looking to the heavens or to self. Peter continues that we should be looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, and here's the point again, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And therefore, beloved, since you look for such things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. The Lord Jesus is coming soon and wars will end. And so we're to grow in the grace and the knowledge of God and in the Savior Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis dealt with this back in the 40s, a subject that really wasn't talked about much um, in more conservative um, circles in, in the UK. And he said this with regards heaven. He said, most of us find it difficult in believing in heaven or to look into heaven, except insofar as heaven means meeting our friends who have died. He said one reason for this difficulty is that Christians have been not been trained 
Would you agree with that? That Christians have not been trained in the things of uh, the age to come, the things of heaven, the glories to come, that, that the most just don't grasp it. And so he says here, C.S. Lewis, that uh, our whole education tends to fix our minds on this world. And that's true, isn't it? The unsaved are fixed on this world. They see no other world beyond this world. They talk about 80 years of life, and that's it. The Christians, sadly, have somehow bought into that lie. C.S. Lewis says, it is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the glorious world to come, that they have become so ineffective in this one. I thought that was a telling statement. The Christians have largely ceased to think of the glorious world to come and that they have now become ineffective. He says, aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in, but aim at earth and you'll get neither. So we must fix our eyes, our minds on the eternal. Because only then will we free ourselves from the chaos that's around us, whether that be war, whether that be division, whether that be the, 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 the nonsensical ways that society are, are running. Fix our minds on the eternal. When Jesus returns, he will establish his kingdom. Amen. And then at last, wars will cease. That is the wars of men will be no more. Isaiah promises it in Isaiah 2 and verse 4. It says, he will judge between the nations. He will mediate for many peoples and they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning knives. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war. And that, brethren, and that world can only come when Jesus Christ is king. It's interesting that the British author and social commentator H.G. Wells, he was the one who coined that phrase, the war to end all wars. He was, of course, referring to the Great War, the First World War. But it, when he said that, it wasn't the fact that it was such a big war that that, that would stop further wars he was referring to the destruction of the german military machine but that stuck hasn't it that phrase the war to end all wars and, and this world looks maybe to a nuclear war i don't know but but we don't look that way because the war to end all wars is when jesus returns as well we've seen earlier the truth that Satan is the ruler of this world. Not sovereign, because God is sovereign. Nevertheless, Satan has a leash, he has a rope, and he has access uh, to many places, many realms that I don't think we're aware of. And so he plays one nation against another nation. And so while he's here, wars will never cease. Satan will continue to foster hatred between peoples, black, white, doesn't matter. He doesn't care because his goal is to drag as many into hell with him as he can. But there will be a divine war. There is coming a war to end all wars, that is all human wars. And it's coming to a planet near you, to our earth. When Jesus returns, as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He will execute retribution upon his enemies. Revelation 19 verse 11. It says that John said, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse. His rider is called faithful and true. With righteousness he judges and he what? Wages war. Jesus Christ will wage war. There will be a cosmic reckoning. So the question is raised now, whose side are you on? And when this great war arrives, the war to end all wars, the divine war, where will you stand? By the way, there's no sitting on the fence. 
There's no agnosticism in this war. There's no neutrality or pacifism. You're either on one side or you're on the other side. Jesus said this himself in Matthew 13, 30. He said, he who is not with me is against me. So if you are listening and you've not yet put your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you stand condemned in your sins and trespasses and you remain an enemy of Jesus Christ. Now, who wants to be an enemy of the creator of the universe? There is no neutral ground. To avoid what is to come requires a commitment to Christ. Now, that's not to turn to Jesus out of fear because Jesus wants us to turn to him because of what he's done, which is to forgive our sins. But war will come. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7 to 8. Paul said this of his own life, and he likened it to a war, a fight. He said, I've, I've fought the good fight. He said, I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. And in the future, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only me, but also to all who what? Love his appearing. Do you love and long for? The appearing of Christ? Is your heart fixed in this world or in the world to come? Not only that, when we think of war, our real war is not fought in the flesh, is it? Our real war is on the spiritual plane. And our weapons are spiritual to destroy strongholds. Jesus has given us the word of God. It is our sword of the spirit, isn't it? You know, and often you don't have to wield it. You just let people fall on it. You know, and with it, we stand against the enemy's lies. Jesus equips us by the Holy Spirit to strengthen us, to give us wisdom, to give us discernment, to say, stay strong in the spiritual war, the spiritual battles of life. Because we all have them. We all have spiritual battles. So Jesus invites us to spend time in his presence. And we do that just by praying and speaking to the Savior. Through prayer, through worship. And what do we do in that moment? We press into God. We press into Jesus. We get to know him more. And in that, we're free from the troubles of this world. And he helps us in our battles. Because Jesus is the captain of the army. Amen. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. He is the captain of the heavenly host. Jesus will never abandon his soldiers. And we are his soldiers. Jesus will never leave you on the battlefield. Jesus will never leave you to fend for yourself behind enemy lines. Because he fights for us. Because he loves us. And so Jesus reminds us that he is constantly fighting for us. He is with us. Even if we don't sense him, even if we're in that place of darkness, he is still with us. And even if we, like many Christians of the past, die for the sake of Jesus, death is already defeated, isn't it? Jesus has defeated death. And so immediately we enter the presence of God. Jesus takes us home to heavenly victory. And so I know I've gone off into other areas. I know most remembrance services won't touch any of this. But we have to look beyond this world and the wars and conflicts of this world. So today, on this Remembrance Sunday, we wear our poppies with pride. And we humbly acknowledge those who gave their lives in past decades and centuries. And maybe like myself, you've got family members who died um, for this country, for your country. And why? For justice and for freedom. And so we thank God for their sacrifice. And we pray that they met the Lord Jesus. 
in those moments if they didn't know him before. But you know, in the end, we don't pin our hopes on the United Nations or even our governments. They don't have the answers to the woes of this world. Our hope is on the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the creator of the universe, who has called you into existence and has chosen you from before the creation of the world to be part of his coming kingdom. And so in conclusion, let me read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Amen. God bless. Let's pray. Merciful Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have your word. We thank you that your word gives us discernment and understanding. It helps us to cut through, Lord, the nonsense that's around us, to see the world for what it really is. Lord, you've created a wonderful world, a wonderful universe, but it is fallen. It is tainted. Man himself is fallen. He is a sinner. And along with that, Lord, comes this push of an invisible enemy the devil and demons, the Lord all together work against the good, work against your people, work against you. And so Lord, we acknowledge that wars over the centuries have been necessary. We acknowledge Lord, those that have fought for justice, fought for the innocent, the orphan and the widow, that have brought peace to areas. We think of the Nazis and communism and ideologies like this, Lord, that have brought such terrible consequences. And we thank you that there have been men and women that have stood up, nations that have stood up against such things. But we know, Lord, that this cycle will never end until you return. So we do give thanks for those that have died on the battlefield for the fallen Lord. But we do ask you, how long, O oh Lord? How long? Lord, we pray that soon, in your mercy, you would return and you would put this world to right. You would rid it of the wickedness, of the hatred, and that at last we would, as a human race, be put under the kingship of Jesus. Lord, we long for that day. We long for your appearing, as Paul did and the apostles and Christians throughout the centuries. And so as we see the world growing steadily more broken, Lord, keep our eyes fixed on heaven. As we cry out, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Amen and amen.